good. So our last speaker will be Michael Kramer. Michael was born in New York, but he soon moved on to Kansas, where he got his high school education. College was at Harvard uh, with an AB in social studies. It might have been 1985. Uh, but from there, Michael went directly on to Western Kenya to work uh, a year as a volunteer uh, as a teacher in school. And by sheer serendipity, that year turned out to be instrumental for the first field experiments that would, he would run uh, several years later. However, before all that happened, uh, Michael took a PhD in economics, uh, was at Harvard in 1992, and like Abhijit, he started off his career by publishing some ingenious theoretical papers, uh, mostly on the macroeconomics of development. He had his first jobs at MIT, but returned to Harvard about 20 years ago. And he has stayed there until today. And today, Michael will speak on experimentation, innovation, and economics. Please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and a big thank you to the Nobel Committee for the recognition of our work and of the field as a whole. Growing up, I was fortunate to be mentored by Larry Weaver, a theoretical physicist at Kansas State University. Larry taught me the beauty of elegant mathematical theory. He taught me more when he mentioned that a colleague had found a mistake in his work. I expected Larry to be upset, but instead he was happy because he cared about advancing science. I thank Larry for exemplifying a commitment to science as a collective search for truth. Thank you also to my father, Eugene Creamer, who taught architecture at Kansas State. Watching him design and redesign something as simple as a poster taught me the value of craftsmanship. So to all my co-authors who've had to put up with my endless revisions, now you know who to blame. <laughs> I'm grateful to my mother, Sarah Lillian Creamer, a literature professor. She taught me that it's our obligation as human beings to address injustice and suffering if we can. I think it was my mother's influence that led me to become a development economist. I thank my wife, Rachel Glenister, both for her critical contributions to the experimental approach to addressing poverty and for endeavoring to keep me focused on the values that brought us to this field. I'm grateful to Rachel and to our wonderful sons, Ben and Daniel, for their love and support. As Abhijit has eloquently said, the experimental approach recognized today helps us to develop a fuller understanding of the world and to advance science. As Esther has said, it can help inform decision makers, and by doing so, has already expanded opportunities for hundreds of millions of people around the world. Today, I hope to show you that in addition to these two vital functions, the experimental approach can be a powerful tool for policy and product innovation. In other fields, such as biology, scientific advances and technological innovation feed back into each other. We're reaching a similar stage in economics as well, one which simultaneously advances both science and human welfare. Today, I'll first lay out some key features of the experimental approach. I'll then provide some concrete examples and show how these features make economics an important tool for innovation. I'll conclude by discussing the need not only for innovation itself, but for meta-innovations, innovations in social institutions designed to accelerate scientific and technological progress and orient it towards human needs. So starting with some key features of the experimental approach. Oops, sorry. 
<laughs> um, my understanding of the experimental approach in, in economics um, uh, has changed considerably since 1994, when I first started conducting randomized evaluations in Kenya. I initially saw them primarily as a way to cleanly isolate the causal impact of a program or policy from potentially confounding founder, factors. I now see them as creating an opportunity for a fundamentally new type of economics research. I'd like to lay out five key features of, of the experimental approach. First, um, being able to isolate causal impact is indeed a very powerful tool. Field experiments have frequently shown that policies have very different effects than we believed based on non-experimental correlational evidence. Ironically, the very constraints imposed by experiments open up new opportunities by forcing us to work in new ways. So in particular, experiments provide economists a much richer and deeper sense of context than we would otherwise have, not least by requiring us to spend time in the field. While most empirical economists previously worked with existing data sets, the experimental approach requires researchers to talk to farmers, teachers, students, and small business owners where they live and work. That, in turn, is useful in generating new hypotheses to test. Third, field experiments address very specific, practical problems, while also often shedding light on larger conceptual questions. Fourth, experiments are inherently collaborative, requiring us to work with practitioners and governments and civil society, teams of survey enumerators, and specialists in other fields. This allows the ideas and experiences of a much broader set of people to enter economics research. And fifth, the modern experimental approach is iterative, both within and across teams, research teams and practitioner teams. This is an important difference between the pioneering randomized controlled trials of the 1970s, which evaluated individual large-scale government programs, and the modern wave of experiments that began through collaboration between researchers and NGOs in the small town of Busia, Kenya. I'm sorry. One experiment might test the impacts of a multifaceted program. A second, perhaps with very different researchers, might seek to understand which components drive the effects or test hypotheses regarding the underlying processes at play. A third might examine if the results could be improved with tweaks to program design, or if similar results hold in a somewhat different context. This is possible in part because NGOs tend to be more nimble, and our smaller budgets forced us to innovate. This smaller scale, relatively nimble approach occurs alongside larger scale evaluations of government programs that have reached hundreds of millions of people, such as the seminal trial of conditional cash transfer programs by the Mexican government. As Esther has noted, the way we learn through the experimental approach is not a single breakthrough in one paper, but the accumulated wisdom and insight from a series of papers. We see this as a prize for the whole community of researchers and practitioners working together to apply the experimental approach to development challenges. These five characteristics together make RCTs a very valuable tool for science, as Abhijit noted, and for policy, as Esther explained. As I'll discuss today, they're also an important tool for innovation. I initially thought of experiments primarily as evaluation, but I now realize that many experiments are more akin to beta tests, useful in developing new products or policies, not just studying existing ones. Spending time in the field, collaborating with practitioners and specialists in other fields, studying specific practical problems, and iterating within and across research, uh, research teams lead naturally to generating solutions ones that have begun to benefit millions across the world. So let me turn to some examples. After finishing my PhD and getting my first job, I made a trip to Kenya to visit the friends I made when I taught school there in the mid-80s. One of those friends, 
Paul LaPea, had just been hired by an NGO focused on education. A central debate in the literature on education economics at the time was the relative importance of resources versus incentives. To overgeneralize a bit, some argued that providing more resources would improve learning, while others argued that teachers and administrators needed better incentives. But even funding skeptics believed, based on common sense and correlational evidence, that remedying a shortage of textbooks would increase learning, and indeed they saw textbook spending as particularly cost-effective. So the NGO decided to provide textbooks, and Paul Gleve, Sylvie Moulin, and I helped them evaluate the program. To my great surprise, we found providing textbooks had no impact on average test scores. Like many failures, this helped us learn something important. That, however, required acknowledging the failure and having a rich sense of context. The school system at the time in Kenya, as in many other countries, was oriented towards the highest performing students. For example, school in Kenya is taught in English, the third language for most pupils in the area. Schools were judged in large part based on their top performing students and hence focused their efforts on them. Many students fell behind the official curriculum, for example, due to malaria, worms, or the need to stay home from school to care for siblings. This suggested the hypothesis that if some students fell far enough behind that they couldn't follow the textbooks, providing textbooks wouldn't do much good. We realized we could test this theory by looking at how providing textbooks affected students with different initial learning levels. Consistent with that theory, the students with the highest initial textbooks benefited substantially, but others did not. So the combination of rigorous testing of causal impact and a rich sense of context enriched our thinking. We started off thinking about resources versus incentives, but wound up with an illustration of how the orientation of education toward elites can disadvantage other children. Of course, subsequent work has gone much farther. You know, the, the wonderful series of papers that, uh, that you know, started with, uh, that, uh, that Esther and Abhijit uh, uh, discussed, uh, starting with work with Sean Cole and Lee Linden. Um, beginning with that, a process of iterative development and testing allowed organizations such as Pratam to refine and widely deploy innovative new approaches such as targeted instruction. While textbooks had a smaller impact than we expected, another strategy, deworming, had a much bigger impact than anticipated. So as background, more than one billion people worldwide are at risk of intestinal worms. Worms are particularly common among school-aged children, which is why the World Health Organization recommends mass treatment of children in endemic areas. Edward McGill and I used the staggered rollout of an NGO school-based deworming program to examine its educational impact. In the short run, we found that the program reduced school absences by roughly a quarter. It wasn't just children who were dewormed who benefited. Other children in the same school, and even in nearby schools, also had lower worm loads and better educational outcomes, presumably because mass treatment decreased disease transmission. In the long run, the program increased the fraction of girls finishing primary school and entering secondary school, and increased students' future earnings enough to pay for the cost of the program 100 times over. In fact, just the increased tax revenues governments uh, collected as a result would more than offset program costs. With technical support from the Deworm the World Initiative and Evidence Action, the Kenyan government scaled the program nationally. Later, various Indian states and eventually the Indian national government adopted similar programs. More than 150 million children across Asia and Africa are now being helped each year. When our work started in the 1990s, many policymakers and NGOs, including our partner NGO, thought it was important to charge people for preventive health products, such as mosquito nets, water treatment solution, and deworming pills. We convinced the NGO 
to try providing free deworming pills at a subset of schools. We found that even the NGO's small fee, less than 40 cents per child, dramatically reduced use of deworming medicine, down to just 17 percent, compared to the 70 percent who participated with no fee. A fantastic series of papers by Pascaline Dupas and others found the same pattern in other contexts, while cleverly testing and finding no empirical support for hypothesized benefits of charging for preventive health product, products. So those results helped lead to new and better health policy. Inexpensive preventive health products are increasingly provided for free, saving lives and improving health for hundreds of millions of people around the world. Similar patterns in which valuable investments have been left unexploited arise in many sectors other than health. For example, Esther Duflo, John Robinson, and I found that many farmers did not make apparently profitable investments in fertilizer. Traditional economic models would have predicted that farmers, being perfectly rational, would jump at such profit opportunities. Historically, when economists saw surprising data like this, they tended to stick with their assumption of rational decision makers and develop ever more complicated explanations consistent with rationality. Development economists have been able to use the experimental approach to iterate rapidly when they find anomalies, testing both theories consistent with rationality and theories from behavioral economics. One of the contributions of the experimental approach has been to show, over several studies and contexts, that behavioral models are often of great practical importance. In this case, we tested a behavioral model of procrastination. Consistent with the model, we found that small, time-limited discounts designed to create a deadline effect had as much effect on fertilizer purchasers, purchases as much larger discounts without the deadline effect. Insights from behavioral economics also led to innovative new approaches to the provision of clean water. Diarrheal disease, often caused by contaminated water, is a major cause of child death in low-income countries. Ted Miguel, Jessica Leno, Alex Swane, and I evaluated an NGO project in Kenya in a region where open springs are an important source of water. These springs are easily contaminated, so the NGO protected them by encasing their sources in concrete. Both in tradition and in law, people in the area had the right to collect water from springs on their neighbor's land. As an aside, these types of communal property rights are common across the world. Many economists believe that establishing private property rights can spur investment. So allowing, in this case, allowing landowners to charge their neighbors for water might encourage them to invest in upgrades, like in casings to make their water sources cleaner. Under certain assumptions, we could estimate how, mu how much people would be willing to pay for cleaner water by measuring how much farther they were willing to walk for it. We found that very few people were, were willing to walk far to obtain cleaner water, suggesting that landowners would not be able to charge much for cleaner water, and therefore few would find it profitable to invest. In fact, we estimated that creating private property rights for landowners in water on their land would, in this context, lead to substantially worse drinking water because people would switch to dirtier public sources, such as streams or lakes, rather than paying for clean water. This is an example of how field experiments can be combined with other techniques in economics, such as theory-based structural modeling, to address questions such as the impact of different property rights systems that are themselves less di directly amenable to experimentation. But returning to the project evaluation, we found that spring protection helped. An indicator of fecal contamination at the springs fell by two-thirds, and diarrhea rates fell by one quarter. However, we also found that water often became recontaminated in storage or in transport to people's homes. So we had to come up with a better solution. Treating drinking water with chlorine kills microbes and keeps stored water safe for one to three days. Households can buy water treatment solution and treat their water themselves 
but many are not able to do so. We tested many possible solutions and settled on a large dispenser of water treatment solution put right at the water source. When people collect water, they can add the right dose of chlorine by turning a knob. In designing the dispenser, we drew on our previous studies and from wider lessons from psychology and behavioral economics to try to increase usage rates. The dispenser was salient, big and bright blue, and placed right at the water source. It was incorporated into something people already did, water collection, so use was convenient and could quickly become a habit. It was visible to others in order to facilitate social norm formation. And importantly, it was provided to customers without charge. The dispenser increased water treatment fourfold, and that increase was sustained when we tested it over the next three years. That innovative approach is now providing clean water for about two million people each day across Kenya, Uganda, and Malawi. As these examples illustrate, the experimental approach can be useful both for science, understanding the world, and for innovation, improving the world. By creating an opportunity for more rapid feedback loops, it can allow science and innovation to move forward together quickly in a mutually reinforcing process. As we see in biology and in the market, systems which create variation in approaches and then select for the most successful ones can be a hugely powerful force for change. Private firms are continuously doing their own experiments in the form of A-B tests, figuring out which innovations work, refining them, and scaling them up. But there are some areas where the private sector won't invest as enthusiastically, even if innovation could serve important human needs. A key insight from the study of innovation is that social choices around institutions play a key role in determining both the pace of technological change and whether the direction of this change matches human needs. There's room for innovation in the set of institutions society has created for stimulating innovation. I'd like to discuss three sets of institutions, those which facilitate experimentation, those through which governments and philanthropists can directly support innovation, and institutions which incentivize the private sector to create specific new technologies, like vaccines, where existing incentives are not fully aligned with social needs. So starting with institutions to facilitate experiments. The scale, complexity, and collaborative nature of experimental work means that it requires new institutions. When I first started conducting research in Busia, we had to create everything from, from scratch. A number of wonderful colleagues and students, including Karen Levy, Carolyn Nicasa, Ted Miguel, and Pascaline Dupas, generously helped to build up a local research infrastructure. Our efforts had an important impact in enabling further research in Kenya. But Esther Duflo, Abhijit Banerjee, Iqbal Dhaliwal, and my wife Rachel at JPEL, and Dean Carlin and Annie Duflo at IPA systematically created a global research infrastructure. Colleagues in the field have developed many other institutions, including Evidence Action, Precision Agriculture for Development, CID at Harvard, SEGA at Berkeley, and IGC. We need innovation in funding institutions as well. So I co-founded and serve as scientific director for Development Innovation Ventures a fund within the U.S. Agency for International Development. DIV supports innovations for development from a wide variety of sources, including social entrepreneurs, for-profit firms, and researchers. DIV is deliberately open across sectors and geographies, and to innovations intended to scale either commercially or through developing country governments or donors. We complement this openness with a tiered, evidence-based approach to funding. DIV makes small investments to pilot and rigorously test promising ideas, and larger ones to help innovations that are supported by rigorous empirical evidence to transition to scale. We recently analyzed DIV's early portfolio. The social benefit 
of just four of DIV's first 43 investments were five times as large as the cost of the entire portfolio. We also found that innovations involving development economics researchers were six times more likely to reach more than one million users as those without. Our results suggest that there's potential for this type of open, tiered, evidence-based innovation fund to deliver high returns for society. They also suggest that social science researchers, accustomed to the experimental approach, have a place alongside social entrepreneurs, technologists, and others in developing and scaling innovations. Rachel Glenister, Chris Snyder, Owen Barter, and I have also been involved in research on ways to harness the power and energy of private sector innovation to address specific needs of some of the world's poorest people. So, for example, under current institutions, the private sector may not invest enough in vaccines needed in developing countries. We propose that donors commit in advance to help finance the purchase of vaccines for developing country needs if they were developed. Such a commitment could both provide an incentive for the development of such vaccines and, and ensure that if the vaccines were developed, price would not be a barrier to access. A group of donors committed $1.5 billion to such an approach for a vaccine against the strains of pneumococcus common in developing countries. At the time, pneumococcus killed 1.6 million people each year. Following the adoption of the advanced market commitment, two firms developed pneumococcus vaccines appropriate for the strains common in developing countries. And those have now been distributed to more than 200 million children across the developing world. These examples demonstrate that innovation in institutions supporting, in, supporting techno, technologi, technological development has the potential to both accelerate technological progress and shape it to human needs. To summarize, experiments are a way to get at causal impact, but they're also much more than that. They give the researcher a richer sense of context, promote broader collaboration, and address specific practical problems. They provide the potential for rapid iteration, both within and across teams. Together, these features make the experimental approach a useful tool for both science and innovation. One key challenge for the future will be the development of appropriate institutions to accelerate innovation and to direct it toward addressing human needs. There's much more to be done. The spread of mobile phones, the availability of large data sets, and the development of machine learning are opening up tremendous opportunities for digital development in areas from education to agriculture. For example, Precision Agriculture for Development, an NGO which I helped co-found, is now working with governments and private firms in multiple countries to provide digital agricultural extension to millions of farmers. But this is just the beginning. We need to encourage a variety of new approaches to take advantage of new opportunities, test new approaches, refine them, and scale up the most effective solutions. As recent work has demonstrated, experiments can be applied to a wide range of problems, from controlling corruption, to encouraging political participation, to fighting climate change, to addressing inequality at countries, in countries at a wide range of different income levels. As Esther, Abhijit, and I have emphasized, this is a prize not just for the three of us, but for a broader movement involving researchers, nonprofit organizations, businesses, and governments that want to improve what they're doing for the broader good and are courageous enough to try new approaches and rigorously test them. This movement has much left to accomplish and plenty of room to grow. It requires many people in many different roles, be they researchers or survey enumerators, entrepreneurs or policymakers. To keep the field moving, we must support the next generation of researchers to address a new set of questions. For a number of years, the Weiss family has generously supported the Weiss Family Fund for Development Economics Research. 
The fund provides grants primarily to graduate students and junior faculty at a number of U.S. universities for research intended to advance the well-being of the poorest. Abhijit, Esther, and I, along with the Weiss family, wanted to expand access to this program to outstanding researchers around the world. I'm very pleased to announce that the three of us will be contributing the funds from the prize and that the Weiss family will be making a much larger $50 million donation to extend the program worldwide, in particular to strong researchers and institutions in developing countries. We are confident that this commitment will empower a broader set of people to use the experimental approach to advance science, inform policies to address poverty, and develop, develop and scale innovative solutions to address human needs. Together, thanks to our partners, we've made substantial progress. However, when these celebrations conclude, there will still be millions of people who wake each day in poverty. We must work together push on and push harder, and we will. Awake here on stage. Awake here. Yeah, please. Very good. So I will not try to summarize what we have heard um, in these brilliant lectures, but let me add, uh, at least end with the reflection. So, so in many ways, um, there are peculiar circumstances that um, uh, paved the way for the research for which you're now being awarded. So it's kind of tempting to ask what would have happened had Abhijit not had he remained an economic theorist, not learned so much from his development students? Had Esther not gone to Moscow? And had Michael not uh, uh, been volunteering in Kenya? Now, that's a high counterfactual question. It is about a hypothetical life compared to an outcome in real life. And many in the audience have made a career um, out of answering such counterfactual questions. Um, via clever field experiments. However, this one, I think, would require a very clever design. Uh, uh, you know, it's maybe possible for particles to be in two places at the same time, at least in the wonderful world of quantum physics. But so far, we haven't figured out a way for people to be in two places at the same time not even in the wonderful world of economic field experiments. Maybe this is as well, because we wouldn't like to put uh, the wonderful lifetime achievements of Michael, Esther, and Abhijit at risk. Would you join me in a last applause for the 2019 laureates? <laughs> <laughs>